Welcome. Welcome to the Rights of Nature Symposium. To everyone with us here today in beautiful New Orleans, on the Tulane University campus, and those joining us by live stream from around the world, we're very happy you're with us. My name is Mari Margil with the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund and our International Center for the Rights of Nature. We are so pleased to be hosting the Rights of Nature Symposium today with Tulane Law School. We also want to thank our sponsors whose support has made the symposium possible, including the Mirren Institute, the Blackstone Ranch Institute, the Wallace Global Fund, and the National Community Rights Network, as well as to give great thanks to the folks here at Tulane, including Jamie Burnett, Patrick Dunn, Catherine Van Marcher, and Jane Johnston, who have made all of this come together. And of course, to our musician, Nelson Denman, for playing so beautifully. Today, we are gathered to explore a new movement that is building to secure legal rights of ecosystems and nature. In just over a decade, we've had the first rights of nature laws passed at the local level here in the United States, with communities now in more than 10 states having enacted such laws. The first countries have now secured the rights of nature into law, beginning with Ecuador, which enshrined the rights of nature in its constitution in 2008. As we all know, nature today is suffering. Ecosystems are collapsing. Coral reefs are experiencing bleaching and die off. The oceans are acidifying. Species are going extinct at more than 1,000 times natural background rates. And of course, climate change is accelerating. 2016 was the hottest year in human record, the third record setting year in a row. That fundamental change is needed is clear. And today we're going to learn about a movement that is emerging which represents a fundamental paradigm change in humankind's relationship with the natural world. This shift is occurring as more and more people, communities, and even governments around the world are recognizing that existing environmental legal systems, which authorize human use and exploitation of nature, are not able to protect nature. These environmental laws are giving way to new legal frameworks which recognize the need to change our relationship with nature. As Columbia's Constitutional Court recently declared, it is time we recognize that humans are, quote, an integral part and not simply a ruler of nature. And as such, they went on, we must establish, quote, a legal instrument that offers nature and its relationships with the human being greater justice. The court went on to explain that it's, quote, time to take the first steps toward effectively protecting the planet and its resources before it is too late or the damage is irreversible. And therefore, it is necessary, they said, to take a step forward in jurisprudence, to recognize nature as a subject of rights. Now, this has happened before, of course with people's movements that have mobilized to recognize rights of those considered rightless under the law. In the United States, we've had movements to end slavery and to recognize of those freed from slavery, to secure rights of women, to secure rights of indigenous peoples, as well as others. These movements were forced to change not only hearts and minds, but the law as well. Today, we have gathered together panelists and speakers from the United States, from Ecuador, from Nepal, Australia, Sweden, from the Ponca tribe, the Hokuchunk Nation, and the Navajo Nation, who will speak of this emerging movement and the need for transformation. They will examine the limitations of traditional environmental laws 
and share with us how a new form of law is advancing that recognizes that nature possesses its own legal rights, rights to exist and thrive, rights to regenerate and evolve, rights to be restored. They will share how and where such laws are moving forward and how they are being defended and enforced. We will also have two keynote presenters, Karenna Gore from the Center for Earth Ethics and Winona LaDuc from the White Earth Land Recovery Project. Unfortunately, Winona has taken ill and was unable to travel to New Orleans, so she will be joining us by Skype later today. So, let's begin. It was about a year ago that my phone rang with a call from a professor here at Tulane Law School. I knew him only by reputation, as someone who was part of developing the first wave of national environmental laws. His name is Professor Oliver Hauck. He attended Harvard and Georgetown Law School. He was general counsel for the National Wildlife Federation. In 1981, he moved to Louisiana where he joined the law faculty of Tulane University. Professor Hauck has served on boards and panels of national science and environmental organizations and is active on issues dealing with endangered species, water, and coastal protection. He also taught comparative environmental law and environmental human rights in universities abroad, including Havana and Auckland. And he recently conducted a seminar here at Tulane exploring the legal rights of nature. We began talking with him about holding a gathering on the rights of nature and as they say, the rest is history, because here we are all today. It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Professor Oliver Hauck. Well, let me add my welcome uh, to those of you in the room and those of you watching from abroad. Uh, uh, this is quite an event. Uh, I've been asked by Mari to say a few words, emphasis on a few words, uh, uh, about my own personal journey toward rights of nature and legal rights of nature, uh, with the thought that perhaps it might track your own. Uh, in my case, it came in three stages. The first was, who needs it? Uh, and the second was, I'm curious. And the third was, voila. Um, and so, to track that a little bit and bring you back in time, rights of nature first hit the, the radar in the United States from a dissenting opinion of the Supreme Court, which did not rule on rights of nature at all. But the dissent raised it and raised a law review article that had discussed it, um, and it planted the seed. Uh, I was practicing at the time in Washington, D.C. for a large environmental group, and my first reaction was, this is interesting, but uh, is it relevant? We had all kinds of standing to sue. We had many members. We had many companion groups in every state. Uh, we had communities that we represented. We had Native American uh, uh, nations and tribes that we represented, the, the Hikarilla uh, tribe of Apache, the, uh, uh, the Beaufort Sea Inuit, um, North Slope Borough. So we didn't need standing. We had it. Nor did we need law. Law was pouring out of the Congress in buckets. You, could, you couldn't suppress it. Uh, there were 15 different environmental laws came out of Congress in that very short period of time. Um, so Plenty of law, plenty of standing. We just, like what would become hundreds of other environmental lawyers, we just put the nose to the grindstone and get working it through. Um, and I didn't give rights of nature a second thought until my Ecuadorian graduate students, international students, came and joined the program and reintroduced me to what was going on in Ecuador. And I was curious. Uh, a, what was happening, and B, could it translate, could it travel? And so, as Mari said, I uh, taught a seminar on it 
in order to find out about it. Now, this is an odd thing. You would think that a professor would teach what he or she knew. I was teaching what I didn't know um, and learning along with them. And in that process came the eureka moment. Um, I'm worrying the thing in my head for weeks, for months. Um, and one evening, I'm out on the Mississippi levee. That's less than a quarter mile from here. It, um, uh, it borders the Mississippi River, which drains three-fifths of the United States. Big river, bordered by trees. And in this particular evening, a flight of whistling duck were come down, down, coming down the river. And when you hear them chattering in the sky, they blow your mind. So I stop, and I look at them. And they're trying to negotiate the power lines that uh, transect the river at that point. And I'm rooting for them to get over the lines. And uh, then it occurred to me. Uh, Everything sort of gelled, and I thought, you know, those birds aren't there for me. They're there for themselves. And it also occurred to me that they had a right to be there. Um, and once I put it in that context, everything else flowed. Uh, and I want to talk about four flows from that. The first is, that everything I was involved in, I had conceived of as a mano a mano, a duo, a fight uh, with, between my clients and how they use nature and somebody else's clients and how they wanted to use nature. But it was always human, human. Uh, and in that fight, nature more often lost than won uh, because the forces on the other side, politically legal and otherwise, were just tremendous. Uh, and uh, it's not to say we lost everything. We, we made some remarkable happenings. But uh, that unequal fight suddenly had a third party. There was another party at the table. And it had its own interests. And those interests were measurable. You could tell what nature needs to exist and to continue to exist and to thrive. <coughs> You can measure it in parts per million. You can measure it in, in, uh, uh, in uh, cubic feet per second. You can measure it in, in the diversity of trees. So here is a new measuring stick. So there's not only a new party at the table. There's a new baseline at the table. Because nature's needs, measurable needs, became a bottom line. No matter what else the environmental programs did or didn't do, here was a new line below which environmental protection could not fall. And I found that extremely powerful, um, potentially extremely powerful, um, worth pursuing. And the third takeout from this for me, once you recognize that nature has a right to exist, you're being very honest. Because that's what I had believed all my life. Uh, that, and that's what moved me to act. I didn't really act because my clients wanted to go shoot things, or fish things, or go see them in binoculars, or take photographs of them. And, all, and they did all of those things. But I, wasn't, I was serving my clients' needs. But that wasn't why I was serving them. The reason I was serving them was I believed it existed. And once you accept that, it becomes supremely honest. You're no longer saying, I'm here to represent these fishermen or these hunters, and it's up against this mining company and this smelter and so many jobs. Um, it's, uh, I'm here representing nature, which has a right to exist and uh, um, and that's very direct. And it's honest. And there's a power of being honest. Think of the power of being dishonest. When you look at the dishonesty that goes on today, all the cover stories and false reasons for doing things, we're now subsidizing coal, of all things, massive subsidies to coal in order to combat terrorism. Go figure. We're now proposing tax cuts for billionaires in order to help the poor. I mean, go figure. Uh, we're now uh, building a border war in order to fence out Mexicans 
in order to prevent crime. I mean, none of these rationales are real. So there's some power in being honest. Um, and uh, maybe I'm late in life, but to me, being honest is about what I have left. Uh, uh, and the last aspect of this is the untapped power of the human DNA in the human heart. As E.O. Wilson once commented, we grew up with nature long before we grew up with anything else. Uh, and our respect for and dependence on and recognition of nature goes back eons before Trump. Eons. Uh, and think of the potential of that feeling being enfranchised and incorporated into environmental protection writ large. I hope my colleagues who might be listening uh, recognize that this movement and this thesis in no way disregards, uh, disrespects, or supplants or replaces existing environmental systems, existing environmental protection systems. They're all necessary. Uh, but it's the supplemental kick of this and the, and the baseline you can't go belowness of this that is a huge value added. Think about enfranchising that from the heart. I mean, I'd love to see the poll on this, and I don't have it. But my guess is if you polled the American people, a significant number of Americans would say, yes, they have a, if nature has a right to exist. It's an assumption. All the people with bird feeders, all the people with, with, with uh, puppy love, all the people with, uh, you know, the thrill of seeing a fox in the wild, whatever. Uh, uh, this is sort of an only indirectly tapped resource. Uh, and if it were tapped, I have a feeling it could do great things for the planet. And this is my closing word, although, is the dean here? Yes, good. Thank you, Dave. Um, Think of the irony of this. Rights in nature may be one of the best ways, maybe the only, but certainly one of the best ways of humanizing human beings in the, in the humanity sense. Um, so the radial effects of this could be far larger than any lawsuit or any particular local ordinance. It's a mind change. Um, and there's something very scary about that to people. And there's something very beautiful about it. And we have changed our minds in this world, and often for the better. Um, so um, the question of this conference then boils down to a simple one. If one is willing to entertain the thought that nature has a right to exist, and to continue to exist, then why not make it real? Um, so leaving that question hanging, because it's really the question of every panel that follows, um, it's my great honor now to present to you the dean of the law school who can make this entire gathering official, legal, regal even. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I have to say, that he has had to cut, he has had to do some, the unpardonable. He has had to cut his class short this morning in order to come to be with us. We never allow that. Uh, and uh, he has also, of course, agreed to be the host of this conference. And so I have a double thanks to Dean David Meyer. Thank you so much. My great regret that I am late arriving to this conference to welcome you uh, because of teaching torts this morning. And, and the, my biggest reason for regret is not being tardy and giving you uh, the all-important official welcome uh, to Tulane, but is in the fact that I have to follow Oliver Hauck uh, by <laughs> arriving late. Uh, that's uh, a position nobody wants to be in. Uh, but he makes my job easier as well in welcoming you because uh, he's made the case uh, compellingly for the importance of, uh, of your undertaking in this conference uh, today. And, uh, and so besides welcoming you to Tulane and New Orleans, uh, I really just wanted to 
uh, have the opportunity to endorse the importance of uh, the conversations uh, that you're going to have today. Uh, and uh, and uh, as, as uh, Oliver has uh, made clear, they're important for multiple reasons. Uh, first, of course, is uh, as, uh, as Oliver has just made the case compellingly, they're important because uh, this is a big idea, uh, and it's a big idea with big potential uh, to have a, uh, a huge effect in changing the nature of uh, legal discussion uh, about a topic that is ultimately, of course, existential, uh, the, uh, the future of life itself. Uh, and so it couldn't, doesn't get more important than that in terms of the subject matter. Uh, it's also important, of course, in terms of the time uh, at which uh, you're engaging this conversation because it's, this is a time of uh, extraordinary uh, both urgency and possibility uh, in taking up this discussion. Uh, the urgency, uh, you know all too well, uh, both uh, the, the threat to uh, the interests of nature uh, are uh, made urgently clear to us both by uh, developing uh, evidence, mounting evidence about the threat to nature, uh, melting ice and species loss and hurricanes in Ireland and uh, everything else along the way, uh, but also because uh, the threat is made more palpable because of mounting resistance to basic science and uh, basic facts, new doubts that uh, seem plausible, uh, more plausible today than they seemed uh, before. So that urgency is real. Uh, but the timing is also important because it's a time of possibility, uh, both some uh, notwithstanding uh, recent developments uh, uh, locally, uh, a time of political possibility made evident through, uh, through uh, international collaboration uh, in uh, things like the Paris Climate Accord, uh, and, uh, and also made legal possibility evident in the uh, the fledgling developments to recognize rights of nature uh, that you'll be uh, exploring today. Uh, this is also not only an important time to take up these topics, but this is an important place uh, for those conversations to happen. Uh, Louisiana is, of course, a place of unsurpassed uh, splendor in terms of the beauty and bounty of nature, uh, but also unsurpassed in terms of the vulnerability uh, of nature uh, made plain to us uh, every day by coastal erosion and loss uh, that make the topics that you'll be discussing seem very non-theoretical. Uh, and uh, so I, I, and it's also, I should say, if you'll allow me a point of uh, parochial pride, uh, it's a place, an important place for you to have these conversations because of uh, Tulane's long leadership uh, in environmental law and policy. Uh, and uh, the pioneering work of uh, Professor Hauck and other members of our, uh, our faculty. Uh, so I want to just with that welcome you to uh, Tulane and, and New Orleans and say how pleased we are to, to have you here uh, and to wish you uh, success and, and the important conversations to come. Thank you, David. Thank you, Dean Meyer. Thank you, Professor Hauck. Thank you, Tulane Law School. Uh, good morning. My name is Thomas Lindsay, and I'm the Executive Director of the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. As I was preparing to moderate this first panel today, which is entitled Limitations of Conventional Environmental Law, I recalled the first eight years of the work of our law firm which consisted mostly of appealing on behalf of community groups wanting to stop a particular corporate project, permits that had been issued to those corporations by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection and other state and federal agencies. While we would win the first, second, or even third round of those permit appeals, the corporate permittees would simply fix their permit application and resubmit filling in the holes that we had identified on the first round. Eventually, their projects, whether they were toxic waste incinerators, factory farms, or frack wells, would then be cited in the community that didn't want them, and we were left powerless to stop them. Those eight years led us to re-examine the work that we had been doing and to question the way in which environmental protection is currently done in the United States. 
After all, it was the very corporations that were the subject of our appeals that were writing the environmental regulations in the first place under which they were ostensibly being regulated. In essence, those industries were writing a script for us to follow in our defense of the community, and we were following it. The first panel this morning focuses on the structural defects of our environmental law and regulatory system. If the current system was working, of course, we wouldn't be here today to talk about new ways of protecting nature. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce as the first panelist this morning, Richard Mott. Richard Mott is Director for Environment at the Wallace Global Fund. Before coming to Wallace Global in 2007, he was Vice President for International Policy at the World Wildlife Fund in the United States, having served as Treaties Officer at WWF International outside Geneva, Switzerland in 1990. In these roles, he was responsible for managing WWF's work on climate change, wildlife trade, whaling, toxics, and development assistance. Prior to his work at WWF, he directed a program on atmospheric pollution at the Environmental Law Institute in Washington, D.C., and served as judicial clerk on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Richard re received his bachelor's degree from Tulane University in 1981 with distinction for an honors thesis in subtropical plant ecology. He received his JD from the University of Oregon in 1985 where he was associate editor of the Oregon Law Review. He has published in various academic journals on topics ranging from the National Environmental Policy Act to air pollution policy with articles in the popular press on biodiversity, climate change, whaling, and other environmental issues. Join me in welcoming Richard Mott. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, when Mari Margill first um, asked me to, if I could appear here, the first thing I said was yes. And then I saw the um, program that Thomas sent me, and I, and I realized that um, I was going to serve as the lead example of what hadn't worked, um, <laughs> drawing on a lifetime of experience. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to uh, oblige on that. I, I wanted to start with a, a quick personal note. What I'm going to talk about today began for me a couple hundred yards from here out on Ferret Street. Um, the first a chance conversation with my then thesis advisor, Dr. David White, who in the, I guess it was May 1981, first mentioned to me just in passing that um, CO2 levels were rising in the atmosphere. And it was the very first mention I had heard of, of climate change, and, and it stayed with me and in, in many ways shaped my career. The, um, the second chance conversation was with Professor Hauck, whom I, I bumped into one fall day um, out in front of the old law school building um, on Ferret and, and asked for counsel on um, environmental law programs in the country. And he said, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, go west, young man. Um, and, and in particular to Oregon, which had, uh, University of Oregon, which had one of the very few active um, law, uh, environmental law clinics um, in 1981. Um, and the rest is really my personal history, but it has always um, driven home for me the um, lasting power of apparently chance conversations, and I, and I want to thank them both. So, um, a little luck here. I'm going to try and get to... Here we go, yeah, all right. Um, to Oregon. Um, in addition to the law clinic, what Oregon offered was a still relatively intact environment, at, at least by the standards that I had seen before then, um, and, and, and tracts of old growth forest. And there was, in the very early 1980s, a, a, a vigorous litigation effort to try and save what was left. And, and I was part of that um, as a student. And so I want to um, moved to a couple of, of the early cases there. Um, the first was a challenge to the Forest Service's um, herbicide spraying, which was being done ostensibly to kill all understory so that the conifers might prosper um, to the benefit of industry. But, but in so doing, um, they ended up saturating the local communities that were living in the, in the, um, in the forests um, with truly horrific um, health impacts being reported, including spontaneous abortions and anencephalic births. 
And, and we, we, we brought pretty vigorous litigation against this, and we were successful ultimately um, in shutting down much of the Forest Service herbicide spraying. But um, at a pace that, for me as a young man, seemed grindingly slow. Um, this was followed by um, the Spotted Owl litigation, which is, I think, relatively more well known, which was itself followed by um, the discovery of the marbled murrelet, another old growth dependent species. And we brought LEPA, uh, NEPA claims and Endi um, Endangered Species Act claims, again with some success. But what was really going on, uh, um, you can see in this slide here, the first um, map is what old growth looked like in 1850. And, and the second map, in case you um, can't make it out very well, um, was not 1980, it was 1920. Um, and you, it, there'd just been this um, crest moving across the country, eliminating old growth forests. And by the time of the early 1980s, we were down to something like 2%, which if I had a map, and, and I don't, um, you probably could not even make out um, the remaining forest. And so in some ways, this national tragedy was going through its final chapters um, in the Pacific Northwest. And, and we were trying to come to grips with it, you know, which itself was the extirpation of entire ecosystems and the functions in them by grasping uh, onto an endangered species or to NEPA procedural violation. But in some ways, what was going on was bigger, uh, certainly than I think my understanding at the time, in some ways bigger than the vocabulary that we had and, and beyond, in some way, um, the, the reach of the tools that we had to, had to fight it. Um, I, in summary, I would say that we had some real non-trivial successes. There are critical stands of old growth that remain today, um, but for this litigation. Um, uh, one of the um, fellows that I knew who worked with this said famously that if the spotted owl hadn't existed, we would have had to invent it. That, that, it, that it really was the tool that we needed, but we were challenging something bigger. And it, you know, on one level, it was a little bit like the um, bringing Al Capone to heel with a tax violation. Uh, environmental banks were being robbed and, and blood was in the streets, um, but we had to, to, to grasp at something that was concrete. And I think um, we were just limited by our tools. Many of the laws that we were working with um, predated an understanding of really the enormity of that, um, of that crisis. And so moving briefly to something bigger, I want to talk about uh, climate change here, um, which following my uh, conversation with David White um, was really 30 years of my career one way or the other. Um, and there are three main accords that, uh, that I worked with. The, the first is the Framework um, Convention on Climate Change that was um, agreed in Rio at the Earth Summit in 1992, the uh, Kyoto Protocol, which followed uh, five years later in Japan, and then most recently the um, Paris Agreement uh, on Climate from December 2015. And it's interesting if you compare these a little bit with the prism of this conference, um, interestingly to me, the Framework Convention, the, the earliest of the agreements, now 25 years old, was the, the, well, the only one that really talked about protecting nature um, and climate systems. But it did so without binding targets to change the behavior of nations or any kind of enforcement mechanism. Kyoto was in some ways more specific in the sense that it included binding targets at least for developed country industrial parties but without reference um, to endpoints like nature or climate system protection. And the, the Paris Agreement is in some way different from both of them. Rather than a top-down negotiated international agreement, it's kind of a voluntary thing where, nature's, uh, where, where nations brought in intended um, contributions and then we added them all together and put them under the umbrella of saying we're trying to stay well below two degrees. And, and the, the, that agreement failed uh, um, patently in that objective in the sense that when you accumulate and add up the um, commitments made, you're somewhere around 3.6 degrees. Two degrees itself, I think, is manifestly um, inadequate to protect nature. There was an ambition to get to 1.5, but as we've seen here along the Gulf in just the past couple of months, even at a degree, we're witnessing um, catastrophic events just for cities 
and at, at a single degree the Arctic is in the process of an accelerated unraveling. So these agreements, um, just to run through them, they, I think, uh, uh, you know, I looked at them through the prism of this conference sort of retrospectively. Most of the effort was about protecting and preserving national sovereignty in, a, in a, an intergovernmental context. They certainly uh, included key first steps, but events on the ground, as we have seen, are outstripping them. Um, nature was scarcely a named beneficiary, much less was it at the table or at the top of the mind of negotiators. And I think there's no you know, better um, reality check on this than to look at the um, Charles Keeling curve from the Mauna Loa um, measurements of the seasonal fluctuation of CO2 in the atmosphere, now at um, 405 parts per million. I think when I started this um, unsuccessful career, it, it was around 375. So I've presided over 35 or 40 percent, uh, 35 or 40 uh, parts per million increase. And if you look at the curve, the second half of the curve moves across Rio and Kyoto and the last couple of blips, I guess, are Paris. But there's no inflection evident in that, you know. And so if you just do the math, um, what we have in the international um, legal context right now is manifestly not taking us to where we as a society needs to go and, and where nature needs to be. I'm, I'm going to close with uh, um, something more recent um, that gripped much of the country um, last year, and this was the, um, the crisis at Standing Rock around the Dakota Access Pipeline. This is one of the, this is the Ocheti Shakowe um, sacred prayer camp that sprang up um, along the Cannonball River. Um, this is a group of activists and a few funders thrown in, including your speaker taking a kneel um, at the far right of the, um, the picture there before that was controversial. Um, and and uh, j just to um, touch on the litigation, I think the, the way to look at what went on at Standing Rock is as an environmental justice case, really an environmental racism case at its core. And it involved a pipeline that had been proposed north of Bismarck, a largely white town in North Dakota, but it was deemed to be too much of a threat to the water supply, whereupon it was moved 30-odd miles south within two or three miles of an important Native American community where, lo, it presented no such threat to drinking water. Um, as is so often the case, the EIS was rushed through um, by a federal agency that was attempting to accommodate industry. And, and in terms of the court rulings, there was refusal to grant an injunction. Trump, early on in his presidency, um, produced an executive order essentially telling the Corps to run this through, which they did. Oil began flowing in the pipeline in early June. But as recently as two weeks ago, um, federal district court in D.C. held that the pipeline was in violation of law on at least three points that had been raised by the litigants, and yet, which went to the risk to the communities, and yet refused to order even a temporary cessation of the oil flow through that pipeline. And now, now I was in this involved, I was funding the litigation through Wallace Global Fund, so I, I'm not as close to... Um, these things as I might have been when I was an earnest law student. But what I was told by the lead attorney is that the standard for securing a preliminary injunction, which is essentially to preserve the situation before harm is done to it, has become so onerous um, in the federal court system that they were currently running zero for 14 on efforts to secure a preliminary injunction. So I would say, um, just an overall reflection on these three or four cases, that it, it's undeniable that many of the most important laws that we have to use predate our understanding of the enormity of the environmental um, crisis. There's a tech bias that runs through many of them. Um, others are focused on procedure, and I think our community has used very resourcefully to try and buy time. And, and I should say they have been wheeled, you know, energetically by a dedicated environmental bar. But the struggle that they're meant to affect remains deeply, deeply asymmetrical for the reasons that Professor Houck, um, I think, um, referred to so eloquently. 
So if I'm not way over time, I'm going to um, take the liberty of closing with a, a quote from um, Shakespeare uh, and Julius Caesar, a well-known quote, um, there is a tide in the affairs of men which taken at the flood leads on to fortune omitted all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in misery. And I think um, from my own view, the flood in our own time, it has been the tide of environmental destruction. And this is whether by the wave of forest loss that broke across continental United States in the last century, it could be the gyre of plastic um, out in the Pacific Ocean, or it could be that continuing crest of the Keeling curve um, and CO2 in the atmosphere. And I think in important ways, we have not yet fully risen as a community to meet that tide. And, and that, to some degree, despite our best and most creative efforts, has, has left us, in Shakespeare's words, um, bound in shallows. And I, I, I believe that um, we can change that and that this conference um, is about beginning the conversation to do that. So thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, next panelist this morning is Tammy Belinsky. Uh, Tammy Belinsky practices law in Virginia. Her practice includes litigating mold exposure claims, right-of-way disputes, and environmental causes. Her environmental law practice has included Clean Water Act enforcement, Clean, Clean Water Act, uh, Clean Air Act permit challenges, and National Forest Management Act project challenges. Tammy's education in the sciences informs her law practice. Tammy earned an AAS in Ecology and Environmental Technology from Paul Smith's College, a Bachelor's in Science in Public Health from University of North Carolina, and a Master's in Environmental Science and Engineering from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. She was awarded her JD at the University of Richmond in 1999 after surviving a career as a water, regu water quality regulator for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, Tammy currently serves as a member of the Board of Directors of the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Uh, help me welcome Tammy Belinsky. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, and everyone for being here. So I, my perspective comes first from my moment as a teenager when I realized all I wanted to do was help nature. I mean, as a teenager, I, I, I really had this moment where I realized I didn't like people that much <laughs> and that what I really wanted to do was protect nature. And so being here today is the place I feel most comfortable, is talking about the rights of nature. So my first um, path to doing that took me to water quality regulation for the state of Virginia. And it really didn't take me very long to, to learn that I wasn't going to be successful writing permits to pollute. I wasn't going to be able to protect anything. And I, one of the uh, uh, structural problems that I saw in my short career there was basically within five years. I was writing water and wastewater discharge permits. I was inspecting industrial facilities. And what I realized was that the law compartmentalizes the resource. And I even hate the word to use resource, but it compartmentalizes water and air and waste, and it regulates them separately. And so the, one of the examples of where I became very frustrated was inspecting and permitting the Goodyear Tire Rubber Manufacturing Plant. I'm going to get really just down into the weeds here. But the, the, I was going to uh, issue a stormwater permit. And at that time, in the early 1990s, stormwater was just being enforced under the Clean Water Act. They were just starting to collect data. And lo and behold, the Goodyear Tire and Rubber's stormwater was full of zinc. And it was starting in just tiny little tributaries running down into the Dan River. And zinc is really toxic at really small amounts. And my sensibility is I'm worried about those little critters. 
being exposed to that really toxic zinc. Well, it turns out the zinc is in the air emissions from Goodyear from manufacturing tires. So it, they, they have an air quality permit. Air quality permits are, uh, is, uh, the, the standards are based on human health exposure at the property boundary. The consideration of it coming, going up into the air and falling back down as deposition and becoming part of the water stream wasn't even, it's, it's still not considered. Still not considered. And it was so frustrating to me that I really wasn't going to be able to make a difference at all. Uh, another example there, another example of finding out that um, a, a creosote plant had groundwater, was, had a, it was a RICRA site on the Roanoke River, being managed by the EPA at that time, not Virginia, and right downstream was the city's drinking water supply. And it just, I, there was no traction for me. I was, you know, I was told to just push the paper. So I decided to go to law school. I get to law school, I was already 35 years old, and I tell you, I had real, a real hard time with the concept of standing, what Professor Hauk spoke of, representing the interests of humans in nature, in, in their, in their own interests in nature and the harm to humans, and the harm to nature is not a factor. And, and uh, practicing law, in the practice of law, when you're representing people who fundamentally want to protect the eagles, they want to protect the eagle habitat that's going to be harmed by the industrial wind turbines or whatever it is that's going to harm the critters. It's, 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 it's becomes, um, it, there's this canyon then between the, 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 the people who want to protect the critter, but the critter isn't part of the process, and it becomes about the, the plaintiffs, the human's interests, and the human's harm. And, it, and it, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an artificial construct that's really very hard to maintain. And I was very frustrated in law school with that. I had trouble with it. At the time I was in law school, Scalia was going to rule on zone of interests, and there's a whole story there about a law school assignment, and my, my law school professor told me he was worried about me, and, good with, re and with good reason, that's why I'm here today, I'm comfortable with you all. So, um, uh, an example in my practice, we use land use law to get at protecting habitat. And it, be, and it, again, it's artificial. We have to use the laws that we have. And so we have the, you know, we have the Clean Water Act, the national laws, but at my level, doing state litigation and, and state law and state practice, we use a lot of land use law to do that. And uh, I had a case where we had a, a river group step forward, wanted to protect a river from a sand and gravel operation. And we had some adjacent landowners who were plaintiffs too, but the, the, uh, the sand and gravel operation not only was on the banks of the river, but they were going to use barges to move the sand and gravel downstream. And we, there's no rights of the river. And unbelievably, we lost that case because we, because the court ruled that we inadequately alleged harm <coughs> from the sand and gravel operation. But had we been able, I think, to allege harm that, that the river had rights, I want to believe that when we have that in the law, that the courts will have a much harder time getting around the regulatory law, which is, I believe, what they do now. I mean, what I've watched in my, in my growing up 
is the, the slow erosion of all those wonderful regulatory laws that had all had good intentions and proper intentions, but that erosion little by little by the regulated community, by the agency capture, that, that erosion has undermined what those laws were intended to do. So, I, you know, the, um, the Keeling curve, the impaired waters lists, I, you know, one more thing. I, I want to do acknowledge Professor Halk. I have had one successful Clean Water Act case, enforcement case. It was great. It was glorious. I can't tell you how stunning the result was. But in the process, one of the, way, one of the reasons why we were so, so successful was that we caught the water authority falsifying data. They had been doing it for six years, and the regulatory agency that I used to work for had never found it. It was stunning to me because it was permit inspection 101. I don't know what the agency is doing. They're not doing their job. This, this uh, authority had been falsifying data for six years. And, but that's what it took for us to be successful in a Clean Water Act case. So the Keeling Curve, the impaired waters lists, the Superfund lists, what I see over my lifetime is a visible increase in air pollution. It's, I can see it. I live on the top of the Blue Ridge. And when I drive down the mountain, I've been driving down the mountain for 25 years, the, I can see the increase in air pollution. Each and all of those measures are evidence that the regulatory system is failing nature. And nature, I believe, has the right. So I hope we make progress this weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. The next uh, panelist is Ryan Talbot. Uh, born and raised in the Allegheny National Forest in northwestern Pennsylvania, Ryan holds a bachelor's degree in environmental biology from Clarion University, a master of studies in environmental law from Vermont Law School, and is a graduate of Lewis and Clark Law School. He currently serves as executive director of the Allegheny Defense Project, where he works to protect public lands from industrial extraction and to stop the construction of new natural gas pipelines. Ryan also currently serves as a member of the Board of Directors of the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Join me in welcoming Ryan Talbot. Thanks, Thomas. A um, couple of cases that I wanted to talk about from the Allegheny National Forest and kind of springboarding off of the, the slide that uh, Richard showed earlier. Um, you can see uh, that, that first slide where you saw all the old growth forests that were still in Pennsylvania. Um, and by 1920, that was gone. And it was shortly after that, 1923, that the Allegheny National Forest was established. And it was established because of that clear cutting. And the federal government went in and said, you know, basically the state has failed to protect, state and private landowners have failed to protect this land. And because of all that logging that had occurred, um, Pittsburgh was flooding substantially, and there were massive wildfires across the landscape from all of the, um, you know, tree limbs that were left. And so in 1923, the federal government started acquiring the land that is now the Allegheny National Forest. And, but uh, nearly a century later, um, you know, the, the same corporate interests that had gone through and just wiped out that forest still basically control what goes on in that national forest. And it's not, it might, you know, they're not going through and clear cutting the entire forest like back then, but they're still, they're still in control and, and doing clear cutting on a massive scale. And, and the oil and gas industry also has uh, com almost complete ownership of, of that national forest. 
um, the, the first oil and gas well drilled in the United States was just outside the boundary of the Allegheny National Forest and kind of uh, propelled the, the oil and gas industry in the world. Um, so the, the first case I wanted to talk about is um, this timber sale case. Uh, at, the, at the time, I think it was the largest timber sale in the eastern United States. And am I too far away? Oh. <laughs> I'm out of time. Um, <laughs> so um, the, the East Side timber sale was, the at, the at the time, I think it was the largest timber sale in the eastern United States. And it was primarily almost all clear cutting. And um, after, after the clear cutting of the old growth forest, the, the, the tree species that came in um, was black cherry. And historically, black cherry was a very minor component of the forest overstory. But after the clear cutting era, it came in like a, it, it's a weed species, and it's also very valuable. So the Forest Service uh, started saying, well, we're going to manage this forest for black cherry. And they even have a black cherry Bible, this whole uh, manual that they have that tells you how they're going to grow trees straighter, taller, and faster. And so black cherry has gone from less than 1% of the forest uh, before the clear cutting era to about 30% of the forest in less than a century. And in some of the understories, it's closer to 50% of the forest. So you're seeing a complete forest conversion that's going on, and it's solely for the value of that single tree species. And we just, you go up, you walk out in multiple parts of the Allegheny, and it's just seas of black cherry. No forest diversity. And so we, the, the Forest Service wanted to log 8,000 acres, you know, basically for black cherry. We sued. Um, initially, we won. It's a bizarre procedural history. But initially, we won. It was a magistrate judge. And then she rescinded her order and issued a second order saying we lost. <laughs> and the, but the issue we had sued on was under the National Forest Management Act that said, essentially, it said that the Forest Service cannot select a logging method primarily based on getting the, the greatest dollar return. And we had a clear case. Uh, the evidence was really strong that the Forest Service is managing this forest because of the value of black cherry. That's it. And we had initially won on that claim. And then six months goes by and the district judge never rules on the magistrate's report. And then the magistrate pulls her order, issues a second order saying, we lost. And basically she said that because Congress didn't define the word primarily in the statute, <coughs> she had to defer to the Forest Service's interpretation. And there we were, like, just straight up against judicial deference to agency interpretations of federal law. And just like that, our win turned into a loss. We appealed to the Third Circuit, and they upheld the dis district judge order. And that was my first case that I was deeply involved in. And I thought, wow, and that was even before law school uh, jaded me. And <laughs> um, so I, I, I was just astonished that that, that had happened. And... Um, so that, and that leads into the next case where deference played a different role, or the lack of deference. Um, the, I, I mentioned earlier that the Allegheny uh, was sort of like the birthplace of the oil and gas industry. And there are thousands upon thousands of active oil and gas wells, tens of thousands at a minimum of inactive abandoned wells. And uh, and, two, and, then, and then we started having the fracking boom on top of that around 2005, six, And because of the way that the Forest Service acquired the land, they didn't acquire the mineral rights under the land uh, back in the 20s. So the, the ind private individual's industry still owns the mineral rights under 93% of the forest. And it's the most lopsided example in the national forest system. So when I say the oil and gas industry owns that national forest, they really do. And so, but regardless, we said, well, the Forest Service still has authority to protect the surface. 
and you have to comply with NEPA because you have discretion to say this road can't be built here so close to a stream. Um, so we sued and shockingly uh, the Forest Service agreed with us and settled the lawsuit and said from here on out we're going to comply with NEPA and do prepare environmental assessments or EISs on future uh, oil and gas drilling. And then the industry, of course, predictably flipped out and they sued over the settlement agreement saying it trampled on their, their private property rights. The federal government had no authority to regulate. And, but I had in the back of my mind, well, we're, you know, we settled with the, the agency. We're, the agency is going to get deference on its interpretation of federal law that they have the right to protect the forest. And they're not taking anybody's private property rights. They're just regulating, which is completely, that's, that's rational. Um, there's, at most, there's just a slight delay when they're going to get the drill. But we get into court, and the, the district judge says the Forest Service gets no deference in this case. And so we went, so it basically, and it was because they said that the Forest Service had changed their position. Because before they said they couldn't regulate, and now they're, they're saying they can regulate, and they didn't offer enough of a good explanation for why they have the authority to regulate. And except that they did, um, but so so the fir the first case we had um, environmental plaintiffs suing the Forest Service, and boom, we're up against the judicial deference to the agency, and the timber industry wins. The timber industry gets their timber off the Allegheny, and but when it's the oil and gas, when it's yeah, it's the industry suing the Forest Service. All of a sudden, judicial deference to the Forest Service goes out the window, and industry wins. So either way, industry, you know, in the, at least in this example, you know, from the Allegheny National Forest, um, industry wins, and it's amazing to see how you know the the juggling of deference can can go one way or the other depending on who the plaintiff is. Um, so that, that's uh, about all I had to, to talk about, but I uh, just would like to close by saying I would, yeah, I spent, the second case took five years, and I worked on that case from the, the complaint all the way through two, two rounds um, in the Third Circuit, one on a preliminary injunction, one on summary judgment. Um, you, you mentioned, Richard mentioned earlier how hard it is to get a preliminary injunction, but the industry got a preliminary injunction to strike down our settlement agreement. Um, so you can, it depends on who you are, again. Um, uh, but what we were fighting for in that second case was the, ap the application of NEPA. You know, just saying that the Forest Service had to apply, comply with NEPA and prepare an EA or an EIS before drilling could occur. So we spent five years working on that. What, if we had been successful, it wouldn't have stopped the drilling. You know, uh, lost in all, both of these cases were what we were actually fighting for. I mean, we were arguing what the definition of primarily was in the first case. Like, we're not talking about nature <laughs> at all. Um, we're just arguing about congressional intent. And so I think, you know, we kind of we really lost sight of that. And I think that's something important to remember when you're writing briefs, you're thinking about ways to frame arguments, um, uh, make sure to, to remember what you're actually fighting for. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, next up is Dr. Michelle Maloney. Uh, Michelle holds a Bachelor of Arts in Law. This is going to take a little while. Holds a Bachelor of Arts in Law from the Australian National University and a PhD in Law from Griffith University in Australia. She has more than 25 years experience creating and managing social and ecological justice programs, including 10 years working with First Nations peoples in Queensland, Australia. As co-founder and national convener of the Australian Earth Laws Alliance, or ALA, 
Michelle manages the strategic direction and governance of the organization, including the extensive partnerships and networks that AILA has with the legal, academic, indigenous, and environmental advocacy communities. Michelle also designs and manages AILA programs and events, including Australia's Rights of Nature Tribunals. Michelle has written a dozen articles, edited two books, and teaches a regular summer school about earth laws at Griffith University. She is also the Australian representative on the executive committee of the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature, a member of the steering group of the Ecological Law and Governance Association, and is co-founder and steering group member of the New Economy Network Australia. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michelle Maloney. Thank you so much. It's um, really delightful to be here, and I thought that perhaps I should actually say hello in Australian, which is g'day, because <laughs> most people expect that. But no, hello, and um, as the only person from Australia here, and perhaps the only non-American person or from North America, it's um, a real privilege to, to share the, the, the stage with these lovely speakers. So thank you to Seldif and everyone for letting me into the country. It's really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I'd like to do, and I, I think we're a bit over time, so I might just touch on a couple of points and try to be a little quicker. Um, for anyone who knows me, that's not a problem. I normally speak too fast. <laughs> um, I'm going to speak very generally about our legal system, just to give you a bit, like a few dot points on, on how it's structured. I'm doing the mic thing. Oh, okay, I do. Okay. Um, and then I might just give a couple of examples, and there's so many similarities um, from what the other speakers have talked about, it's really good because I can kind of connect some of those horrible things that are going on in Australia to some of the things that are going on here. So, so Australia is a constitutional monarchy. It's very embarrassing to a young-ish person like me that we are still not a republic. Um, but like other Western legal systems that were created by the English, we have certain um, ways of being in our legal system that um, deeply affect our relationship with the natural world. Like many other Western legal systems around the world, um, we had a proliferation of environmental laws from the 1970s onwards. Um, one other thing that's handy to know is that Australia is a federation. The states came first, all the colonies came first. And then in 1901, we had a national constitution or a federal constitution, so the Australian government was born. Now this matters because um, predominantly our environmental laws or resource management laws, and I also hate that word, um, the, the powers lay with the states. So today in Australia we have laws all over the place. We have them coming out of our ears. We have laws for national parks, for threatened species, marine protection, water management, air pollution, laws regulating pollution from industry, all the usual environmental laws. However, that has not stopped Australia from having, I think it's the world's second, whether, world's second worst offender for mammal extinction. Um, we've all but decimated old growth forest. Uh, the um, colonial folks who invaded the continent of Australia um, did so with a body of English law that not only disrespected but legally ignored uh, the First Nations people in Australia. There are no treaties. They claimed the international uh, framework of terra nullius, empty land, which is a profound and deep insult to the oldest continuous culture on earth. Uh, indigenous people have been in Australia, so the scientists say, at least 70,000 years. It's not 2,000 years or 10,000 years, 70,000 years. Um, so the English, or what I like to call the medieval legal system, that, in, that plonked itself on top of the Australian continent in 1788, <coughs> just cheerfully dumped um, an entire structure of property law, um, feudal power and hierarchical structures upon one of the world's most profound earth-centered cultures, 500 plus language groups and deeply established estates across the, across the um, entire continent. Bioregional earth-centered governance had been in place and had managed the continent very beautifully for millennia. So where does that leave us in Australia? Well, we have a national environmental law, the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, or EPBC. Um, it enables the federal government to step in now and then and protect the environment in various states or territories in certain circumstances, very rare. Um, and it's normally when there's a hook like an endangered species. Otherwise, day-to-day -day management of natural resources or the environment falls to the states. So, the problem with environmental laws in Australia, like many other places, is that they're really just a poor cousin to the much older, deeply embedded, hundreds of year old medieval laws. And I keep saying medieval because they are, and particularly in Australia, if you commit a personal, if you commit a crime, you're, it's the crown, 
versus you. I mean, it's the crown. It's, it couldn't be more visually medieval than, than possible. So um, the government can authorise... The government is basically the owner of all the land in Australia. So that, to me, is pretty futile. Do we feel like peasants? Yes, occasionally. Um, technically, like over here, I guess the government can authorise use and abuse of the land, but then the relationship between the government and corporate powers is, is just as... Um, glued together in such a way that both corruption and distortion in the legal and institutional systems of Australia are rife. Um, other key characteristics of the Australian legal system, private property is paramount. Um, logging and agricultural land um, has really created most of the land clearing uh, in Australia. But interestingly, agricultural land is of course leased to private land holders. And up until even the last decade, there were pretty much no land clearing laws um, unless certain triggers, again, for endangered um, areas. So although we still have many beautiful ecosystems, all of our old growth forests have been decimated. We have phenomenal land degradation areas. We have a very ancient continent. Um, it, like North America still had glacial and volcanic activity much more recent times. We still have places in the centre of Australia that Fink River is the oldest continuous river on Earth. Um, there's 300 million year old ripples in the sand up in Kings Canyon near Ayers Rock. It's a really old place. The mountains are not high and pointy, they're all rounded and slow. Um, it's a phenomenal ecosystem and we've done pretty much everything by the letter to destroy it as fast as we could, those of us who are the uh, invader settler types. Now, so similar to what some of the other folks have been discussing, we have mostly in the state level, people are trying to stop unwanted developments through planning and land use laws. Um, basically, however, our planning legislation is really just a way for enabling corporations and others to just continue the urban sprawl, to continue taking out forests, even regrown forests. We eat into green spaces. We're continually having residential developments that are significantly larger than perhaps they were in the 70s. Um, the land clearing and threats to wildlife continue and are legal. In fact, they've even been repealing some of the native animal protection laws in New South Wales. And ultimately, what I like to call the kind of the gods of the law or supreme laws are our petroleum, coal seam gas, which we call it coal seam gas or unconventional gas. What you guys call fracking, we do different forms. We don't have a lot of true fracking. But basically, petroleum, gas and mining laws reign supreme over everything else. Whereas private property law is meant to be, um, you know, paramount in the English legal system, as you know, I think it's pretty much the same here. Um, the crown likes its shiny baubles and from medieval times was always allowed to have the rights for everything under the earth. And in Australia, um, the introduction of fracking, coal seam gas, uh, exploration and, and drilling um, about 10 years ago has actually meant that even private landholders, even the folks who were singularly responsible for a lot of the land clearing, have suddenly discovered they have no rights to stop this new exploration and this new use of their own land. Um, so our laws have not given anyone any rights to stop fracking, to stop coal seam gas, and often to not even to stop coal mines. So what these laws do is they actually allow, um, the government allows private drilling and private other operators to just turn up on land. Many farmers literally looked out the window and guys were turning up with machinery to have a little poke around on their land and they had to find out what the heck was going on. Some folk didn't even know things were about to happen until they read something in the newspaper and people were on their land. So suddenly we saw these interesting alliances and um, I guess to, to me, and I've spoken about this with, um, with Thomas and Murray, is one of the greatest indicators of the failure of environmental law or law generally in Australia to protect the natural world or even local communities. Um, is the really powerful rise of civil society. Um, a group directly in response to gas mining is called Lock the Gate, and that was when farmers and environmentalists, who had often been at loggerheads themselves, um, started to work together and literally locked the gate so that they wouldn't let these guys into their land and they wouldn't let them on country. Um, so they developed this sort of massive triangular yellow symbol, Lock the Gate. And it ended up with between 15 and 20,000 people across the eastern seaboard of Australia participating. And the protests and, and the attempts to stop all these activities have become so profound that several years ago the New South Wales government and a couple of others actually passed new laws trying to make protest illegal. So the legal system was failing your ordinary community person. They were rising up in a way that was peaceful, so peaceful. Australians with their sort of 
anglicised heritage were so compliant. We, some of the environmental activists actually had to teach farmers how to say no. You know, like they're such polite people that offer you a cup of tea and a scone, but they're saying, no, you've really got to stop letting these people onto your land. So the law was failing human beings, failing the natural world. And then when civil society was taking it upon themselves to be very peacefully, legally disobedient, then they passed really nasty laws to try to imprison people who were protecting their own land um, for up to six or seven years. The only good news is the High Court has decided this year that those protest laws um, breach an implied right to protest. But some of those laws are still out there. Um, so I guess what we're facing in Australia is not just the failure of environmental law, but ongoing laws that allow the destruction of the natural world. Land clearing, logging, they're still felling the remnant old growth over in Western Australia. Um, and what we see is a continual failure to consider anything um, beyond human and particularly corporate needs in the legal system. So I guess this is starting to sound familiar. Um, the map that um, was shown of the destruction of forests looks the same for Australia if you look at 1788 versus today. So I'll probably wrap up with um, the last big issue that um, I will talk about, which is Pretty actually, it's humiliating for someone who is passionate about the earth and loves my country because it's a fun place to live. But we, um, we were called by a friend recently the last coal colony on earth. Despite the science, despite all of the indications, despite everything all thinking human beings know about climate change, our governments are still permitting new coal mines in Australia. Worse, we've got one of the biggest in the Southern Hemisphere looming towards where I grew up called the Adani Carmichael Coal Mine. It's an Indian-owned mine. Citizens have tried every legal angle known to humanity to stop this mine. Um, I was recently, for the last six years, the chairperson of the Environmental Defenders Office Queensland, which is what I would call a traditional environmental law, public interest environmental law group, taking cases using the existing legal system to try to stop this coal mine. Every case has failed. There are no hooks within our legal system around climate change to stop the mine. Regardless of the fact of what the physical footprint of the mine, the transport rail and port issues will do to the Great Barrier Reef, which is World Heritage Protected, which has already copped several years of bleaching for the first time in record history. Despite all of these things, judges are still interpreting these clunky little laws by saying, we can't see these extra impacts. It's just a coal mine. It's not really going to contribute to climate change. So the ultimate failure of the law is that the government of both Queensland and the federal system see these kinds of mines as really great for the environment, uh, the economy. Interestingly, the sheer amount of civil society disruption, we've had these um, awesome divestment campaigns and many of us have done physical protests, um, non-violent, wherever we can. All of the banks in Australia have pulled out of investing in this mine. Uh, banks from around the world have pulled out from investing in the mine. But the Queensland government's still sitting there saying, please come, you're very important to our economy. So probably to finish off, I, um, I normally don't dwell on the gloomy stuff. My organisation, AILA, actually spends all of its time building a really different vision and, and practical projects, but to focus on the, the, I guess, the horrible things that our environmental laws have done, um, it's simple to say. Current environmental laws are powerless in the face of mining, petroleum, pro-development land use laws, um, the ongoing logging, and all of the pollution issues that are coming out of uh, the activities that we make legal. So on that depressing note, I'll end up. <laughs> Tom, they already know me. Good, thanks. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, the final presenter for the panel this morning is Tulane's own distinguished professor, Oliver Hauck. Professor Hauck. Thank you very much, Tom, and thanks for your patience. It's uh, it's almost getting to be time. <laughs> um, very much appreciate, again, your being here. I'd like to start with a shout out to so many people, and you know them, lawyers, activists, local groups, communities, Native Americans, who've been in this a very long time. Think of the Pacific Northwest, 
uh, Native American restore the salmon initiatives have been going on over a century and are beginning to bear fruit. Uh, nothing that I say today, and I don't think anything any of the panelists say today should be misinterpreted as disrespecting that, as saying it's been a waste of time. Uh, uh, absolutely the contrary. You all have been indispensable and you will remain indispensable, including the laws you're working with. Uh, and I can't wish you a, a heartier Godspeed. May you thrive. Uh, we could not do without you. Um, now, this panel deals with limits, and I've been asked to uh, fall into that vein. I'm happy to do it. Uh, I'll do it in two levels. I'd like to do it locally so you see it, and then I just step back to a, con to a conceptual uh, uh, point that I think is the greatest limit of all. Um, and uh, so uh, without further ado, we are now in the Louisiana Coastal Zone. And uh, when you fly over in an airplane, you'll look down and see some green and you'll see some hash marks. Uh, if you get closer, you'll see a lot of hash marks. And this is one industry and one zone. The zone is five million acres of wetlands at one point, although we're losing them at 20 square miles a year, three acres every hour. Uh, this is, has been one third of the wetland inventory of the United States, coastal, uh, one quarter of all the migratory birds that fly, one third of the commercial fishery. This is a big deal. Uh, so here's what's down there. We're going to take an overflight and we're going to go at speed, okay? Uh, these are pipelines that transact and these are just transect the zone and these are just major pipelines. Imagine they all have feeders. Um, now if I can advance it. These are oil and gas fields in South Louisiana. As you see, there's no landscape without them. Um, let me see if I can do this. I may be beyond my pay grade here, Richard. I'll try this one. Okay, good. Oh, I see. Here is one parish below us. They are counties, and here's Plaquemine, and these are production wells in Plaquemine. Is there any place in Plaquemine without them? Uh, Lafourche, directly below us. Uh, Terrebonne, below us. All of these, by the way, are hurricane corridors. When these marshes go, we get slammed. Uh, one acre. One mile of marsh knocks down hurricane surge by six inches. And there's 50 miles of this between us and the sea originally. Uh, so what's happening? Here's canal access Golden Meadow. This is just a traditional uh, access to an oil and gas deposit. And this is what it looks like afterwards. It once was grass. That's the remaining field. Uh, Point Ocean, every one of those little tags is a separate oil and gas activity. Uh, Point Ocean is not only a wildlife management area, it is the home of the Point Ocean Native American uh, sub-tribe of the Homa uh, nation, and uh, uh, they felt the brunt of it. Here's what their territory looked like before, here's what it looks like now, open water and they're having to move. Um, here's the city of New Orleans at the top, and below us about 10 miles is Delacroix. We're just gonna focus in on that little triangle of land. Understand, this is the buffer for not only a great wildlife area and nature area, it's also hurricane protection in the raw. Here's what Delacroix looked like in 56. In comes the first dredge canal. And see the break up off the first canal? Here's the second canal coming in. See the break up after the second? And there it is in 2008. We're done. It's water. Now we're going to take a tour of the parishes. Just get in your plane and fly. We ready? Here's Plaquemine and Parish. It's what it looks like from the air. Here's St. Bernard. It looks like from the air. Understand, previously you were looking at a very living tapestry of green. 
Uh, here's Jefferson Parish below us. LaForce Parish below us. Terrebonne. Vermilion. Cameron. Um, and I won't go further. There are ways to stop this with off, over, over marsh vehicles. They're being used in Suriname. We had none of it. There are ways of restoring a canal. Here's an old canal. Here's recovery after two years. You just push the banks back in. Here it is after four years. Outside Jean Lafitte Park, there's been no backfilling. There's been no restoration out there. And the use of off-road vehicles were stymied. The oil and gas industry just does it another way, and they do their thing. Um, so what's missing here, the landscape being so badly damaged, is restoration. And I think some of you mentioned that in your presentations. But uh, it seems to me that th perhaps the most successful and implementable ingredient of rights of nature is the duty to restore. We cannot get the industry to pay for restoration here. They absolutely stonewall it. Basically, their position is we employ people and we're good for the state. Go home. Uh, and uh, the fact is, both of those things are true. And they've made billions of dollars doing what they do. But uh, we have been unable to tag the industry with the bill to pay for the harm that they've caused. Uh, Duty to restore would be absolutely key. Um, now I want to deal conceptually for a moment, because I know we're running short of time. The greatest advantage to conventional environmental laws is pragmatism. It has reasons for doing things that benefit humans, uh, human health, um, human use and enjoyment. Uh, and those are identifiable. And so when you're passing legislation in this area or you're uh, uh, litigating in favor of an environmental program, uh, these, are, these are things the court immediately picks up on. Uh, but that human element, we do this for humans, is also the greatest limit and disadvantage of conventional environmental law because humans change. And they can change like lightning. Uh, they can change overnight. And when the humans change, the humans in power change, then these programs tank. No programs are t in the world are tanking as fast as in the United States today. There's almost a race to tank the most. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a nightmare. And th that is the Achilles tendon of conventional environmental law, that by pinning it all on humans, you leave your susceptible self susceptible to human changes that will just blow you away. It doesn't care what the program says. They'll repeal the program, they'll repeal the regulations, or they just won't implement it, or they won't fund it. And they're doing all of those things and more. Um, so uh, the, and this is not just, by the way, the US. Uh, I'm sure that our Australian colleague could tell us horror stories in Australia as well. And it's sort of a nasty wave. So there needs to be a counter wave. And there needs to be a break on this stuff that is not based on humans, that's external to humans. Uh, and the nature of that break and its utility and its future is exactly where we're going in the rest of the panels. So I guess this sort of tees it up, Tom, for, for that to come. So thanks for your patience, and I look forward to any questions. I'm sure we all do. You might have or any other comments. Thank you.